was talking about obesity and why people get fat, and we know that's due to genes. Well, it's also due to your diet, isn't it? And that's environmental. So what you eat is down to nature, what's put in your plate, nothing to do with you. But these results tell us something different, that actually what you pick to eat is actually genetic more than it is environmental. So we know that there, are, there is a bitter taste gene that some people taste things as much more bitter than others in 100% a, in a of you. We also know that some called food neophobia, that means absolute fear of a certain food. It might be, in my case, it's like beetroot. Other people, you know, everyone, and we've had kids, they have, kids have lots of neophobias, and uh, they won't like certain items, and we know that's highly heritable. People who overeat when they get distressed, and they hit the uh, ice cream in the fridge when they're having a cry or whatever, that's very heritable. As is how much sugar you put in your tea, whether you have a fruit and vegetable diet. So the government's telling us five portions a day is very important. You must do that. Some of you find that much more pleasant than others. Some people love fruit and veg. Others see it as a deadly poison. And it's not cultural. That's the other thing. Because garlic eating is the other important thing. We thought that was just having an Italian mother adding garlic to your spaghetti. But no, all of you told us that actually there's genes that decide whether you like the taste of garlic or not, that is separate to where you were raised, where you were brought up. So, and similarly with being vegetarian or lighting chicken or red meat. So all these things that we assume we don't have any control over, and it's purely outside forces, all of us inside are much more different than we thought. So the idea of our own identity, I think, is changing by some of these uh, discoveries. And other ones, which we always assumed were, again, outside our control, is this list. So we have exercise. Some people love to jog every morning for an hour. Other people, when they hear the match of the day music, feel nauseous and sick. <laughs> That's the natural variability. And no one's pretty worked out why some people get an adrenaline rush, this big hit of reward hormones in the brain when uh, they do exercise, and other people just get nothing. And those people who get nothing are much less likely to exercise than others. We found that after the age of 21, cooperating with twin registers in seven other countries, we found 70% of the differences between people is due to their genes, not their environment. And it doesn't mean that you you can't get people to exercise, or you can't get them to eat certain things. It just means that the threshold at which they'll do it is very much higher. None of these things are absolute. They're just showing you that there are differences between all of us in the way we respond. And similarly, how much alcohol you drink is highly heritable, and alcoholism as well is, is, is a well-known both disease, and even the, the leisure amounts are also heritable. But clearly, it's possible with strict social and cultural changes, such as um, if you're some strict religious sect, there's no way you're going to drink alcohol, even if you've got the genes for it. You might gamble more or smoke more or do other things, but um, it's, it, can, it can be changed. We talked about food preferences and dietary things. So all of these things, including even social class, which is often measured by your profession, your choice of profession is highly heritable. So there's very little out there that is purely nature purely environmental. And other choices are also surprising. We surveyed you for very secret data about infidelity. And strangely, of all, this, of all the topics we had, this seems to have got the most publicity. I can't work out why. <laughs> I can't believe anyone's interested in this stuff, but they were. And the headlines actually are interesting because they got it, got it wrong. It's not deterministic at all, and it didn't mean that only one in four women have the genes. It just meant there are genes that give people different amounts of susceptibility to staying with the same partner forever or not. And this is so logical in a way because if you look at the animal kingdom and everywhere else, you know, women have to keep their options open in order to keep the genetic line going. Otherwise, often in order to have children keep their 
genes alive. So keep their genes alive. So there are things that you wouldn't have thought of as genetic, and you would have thought of as purely environmental or cultural, that are in fact are not the same at all. There's a whole list of other ones that we looked at, which also have got other press interest. So clearly going with infidelity, not far behind is divorce. It's always important to look at the, if you, if you are thinking of marrying or marrying again, uh, look at the in-laws and see how many, uh, what marriages they're on, give you a clue. If, it's, if you're already married, it's a bit too late. Jealousy is another one. And then your sexual preferences, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual. Our studies have shown that 40 to 50 percent of that differences between people are actually due to genes, which goes against the certain eccentric groups who try and convert people, uh, by often as religious groups, saying this is a purely a uh, question of willpower and um, the way you've been brought up badly, not true at all. And promiscuity, libido, even such strange things as whether females can easily have orgasms or not is under genetic control. Entrepreneurship, how successful you are as a businessman or businesswoman, how much you like going on, on your own and taking risks, again, highly heritable. Not something that's easily learned. You either got that instinct or you haven't. Uh, all the personality traits that we've studied are around 50% heritable. There is an environmental influence, but strangely very little about the fam from the family. The family doesn't seem to pass on much of your personality. It's a combination of your genes and your life experiences. And that's not what we would have predicted. And uh, lastly, body odor, which is related to your success at all the above, is strangely very heritable as well. There was a test. It's quite a hard thing, if you think about it, to test for body odor as a genetic trait. Who's going to assess body odor? You can do it chemically, but it's extremely expensive. So in a, with a group in uh, Newcastle, we had a highly selected group of uh, sniffers who took uh, cotton wool buds. We took cotton wool buds from some of your armpits a few years ago, put them in special jars, and we had 100 sniffers who rated them. And some they thought were marvelous. <laughs> really nice smell. And others, basically, they, they fainted or you know, felt very sick. But some people, there was no great consensus over this. And, and it's a lot of individual, you know, one person's smelly armpit is another person's you know, aphrodisiac. And this is what this study really showed us. So we do do some strange studies. Uh, but if anyone wants to volunteer for that one, let, let, let me know if you but um, that was the way we found out that actually uh, the odors people emit have a genetic basis. And uh, of all the studies I've done, actually, I did get the, probably the most mail from um, people about this. And this was, it was actually from sufferers who do have very bad body odor and have tried every single treatment going and were desperate to have gene therapy for it. So strangely, you don't realize how many people do suffer from this. You know, bathing three times a day, but they still had a smell that most people found extremely unpleasant. It, it often takes a sort of try the odd study to find out things where there's a, a, a big need you hadn't even thought about and just regard as a bit of a joke. Mm -hmm.